Well, what are the big stories of this past week? One of them is the decision in Massachusetts legalizing gay marriage. And it's very, very interesting that the idea that two homosexuals can get married, whether it's two men or two women, and that they can have the blessings of the state the way a man and a woman getting married can have, and thereby enjoy such benefits as being able to pass on property to the other if one dies without having to go through probate, without having the will challenged or lack of will uh, challenged. And all of this is so terrifying to social conservatives. And the interesting part of it is that the conservatives say that we must preserve marriage. And in fact, the constitutional amendment that they want to pass to overturn these state decisions that legalize gay marriage the constitutional amendment is referred to as the defense of marriage act well nobody's attacking marriage if anything people want to be married and they want to get in on the action of marriage so why do you have to defend a marriage against homosexuals why do you have to feel that a marriage can only be between a man and a woman that may be what you think a marriage ought to be well that's fine well, uh, I think the front lawn on the property in the neighborhood ought to be a certain way, but I don't have to have a law about it. It's just my own opinion about it. And I don't have to keep my lawn the way the guy across the street keeps his lawn. I can just do what I want, and he can do what he wants. And you can get married any way you want, and there's no reason to be shutting out other people and not letting them get married any way they want. It is no skin off of your nose. But it is the interesting thing about it to me is the way they keep talking about the defense of marriage, the preservation of marriage, as though marriage itself was under attack by this horrendous idea that two people of the same sex could enjoy the same blessings of the state. And God only knows why anybody wants the blessings of the state. But if they do, why can't they have the blessings of the state as well? But it's got social conservatives in an uproar. And, of course, that's not the only thing that's got social conservatives in an uproar. What's the other thing that got him in an uproar? Well, you know as well as I do, Janet Jackson and the Super Bowl party, the halftime entertainment at the Super Bowl where Janet Jackson's front uh, whatever blouse was ripped open and revealing one of her breasts. Now, my wife and I watched the Super Bowl, and we watched the halftime thing. I, I have to say I suffered through the halftime entertainment. It is not my kind of music. It is just loud and raucous, and I get nothing out of it whatsoever. And more than anything else, I find it terminally or interminally boring. But there you are. I watched it more out of curiosity to see what they would do because it just seems like every year the halftime show gets more and more boring to my taste. And, of course, you sometimes watch the Super Bowl just to see what new commercials are going to be presented. And I didn't see any new commercials that I thought were particularly exciting. So the Janet Jackson thing happened when I saw it. I didn't know if what I'd seen is what I saw. For all I knew, they ripped the front of her blouse off, but she had something on underneath that just had a dot in the center of it. And it was only when people made an uproar about it that I knew that she had actually bared her breast. Well, so be it. So it upset some people, and other people thought it was great, but that's the nature of the world. Different people have different tastes, and different people have different uh, opinions about things. But what is interesting is that conservatives, you know, the conservatives, the ones that are for limited government, the ones that are for less taxes, for smaller government, for uh, less uh, spending, for less regulation, and so on, you know those people? Now they're crying to the government, do something about this, do something about this. The FCC ought to do something about this. There's a woman named Rebecca Hagland who was an executive for World Net Daily, the big conservative Internet publication, and now apparently is associated with the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank. She was on one program being interviewed about this, and she was saying that the FCC should be letting huge, huge fines of hundreds of thousands of dollars against people like CBS and MTV and so forth to, so that they'll get the message, so that they'll realize that they can't do this. It's always the same thing. I want something, and I want the government to levy fines and imprisonment on people who will not do what I want, people who will not live as I want. Yes, the Super Bowl is supposed to be family entertainment. Yes, it may be something, uh, and they're presenting things that children, you wouldn't want your children to see. So what? If you don't like it, don't watch it. And if a lot of people don't watch it, they won't do it anymore. They'll do what they think people might want more. The answer is not to run to the government, but to simply withhold your patronage. You can watch the Super Bowl without watching the halftime show. You can watch the halftime show without watching the Super Bowl. You can watch the referees without watching the players. You can do whatever you darn well please. But don't go to the government every time something turns out differently from the way you want it. Now, I guess tonight I'm beating up on conservatives, but, you know, part of the reason for that is that for years and years I found myself beating up on liberals. And the reason was that liberals controlled everything. Liberals were in charge. Liberals uh, had the presidency at least half the time, and they had Congress all the time. You know, the last Republican Congress uh, went out of business in the mid-1950s, and there wasn't another one until the mid-1990s, 40 years at Democratic Congresses. So the liberals were running the show, and I found myself 
complaining and criticizing and beating up on the liberals all the time. But now it's the conservatives that are running the show. We have a Republican president and a Republican Congress. And some people would argue, well, these people aren't conservatives. Uh, they're just a bunch of big government people uh, who decided to run as Republicans instead of Democrats. And I couldn't argue with that. But they are the people in charge. And the conservatives who ought to know better are hanging on to these people the Congress and the President, because they think it would be worse if they had a Democratic President and a Democratic Congress. And so they will always give you the story that they'll vote for these people no matter how bad they are because they're the lesser of two evils. Well, let me tell you something. George Bush is not the lesser of two evils. The Republican Congress is not the lesser of two evils, and here's why. When Bill Clinton was President, when the Democrats controlled Congress, the conservatives provided opposition. They complained about big government programs. They complained about wars in Serbia. They complained about missiles shot at a pharmaceutical plant in the Sudan and missiles shot at Afghanistan. But now that a Republican is in power, there is no opposition. The Democrats never argue strongly against any big government program, whether it's war or even social uh, government, whatever it may be. And, of course, the conservatives won't argue because it's their guy that's in office. So far from getting the lesser of two evils, we get the worst of all evils when we have a Republican president and a Republican Congress because there is no longer any opposition from anybody in the two major parties. And the only people who are providing the opposition are people like you and me, people who don't have a very loud voice, people who aren't heard by very many people. The best thing that could happen right now, with, for, as far as the two major parties are concerned, would be for them to trade places and to have a Democratic president, a Democratic Congress, and Republicans screaming bloody murder about the terrible things that Democrats are doing. And instead, what do we have? We have a Republican president and a Republican Congress and Democrats making minor complaints based solely on the fact that it is Bush that's doing it. They're not complaining about war. They're complaining about Bush's war, for instance. Let's go ahead and get to the phones and see what people are thinking tonight. Let's talk first with Jacob in New York. Good evening, Jacob. Hi. Um, I have a couple points to make about the gay marriage issue, if I can. Sure. I, for one, find it ridiculous that the Republicans are talking about defending marriage when you have a divorce rate of about 50% for heterosexual <laughs> Very good. And you have people like Rush Limbaugh and Newt Gingrich who have two or three wives. They've had two or three wives, and divorce is one of the biggest problems. And you have domestic abuse, you know. And So I don't really buy the arguments that we need to defend marriage. And secondly, the whole part of the constitutional amendment goes completely against Catholic Republican principles of, you know, states' rights and limited government. But I'm not surprised because the Republicans have just become the party of big government conservatism and the Democrats are the party of this big government liberalism. So it's not really a difference. Yeah, how true. Uh, yeah, you're making some uh, good points there. And, of course, people like uh, Newt Gingrich and, to a certain extent, Rush Limbaugh and others, I don't think really care one way or another about all this. They're just simply playing to the crowd, and the crowd in this case being the social conservative constituency, the uh, Christian fundamentalists. Uh, and by when I say Christian fundamentalists, I don't mean all Christian fundamentalists. I mean the Christian fundamentalist noisemakers like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and others, whom the politicians feel control a fairly large constituency. But you know Newt Gingrich doesn't care that much about the sanctity of marriage. Obviously, he's demonstrated that in his personal life. Uh, he's, he's got about as much respect for marriage as Bill Clinton does. <laughs> it's the only good thing that I mean, Republicans, I think, need to lose this year, and not because they want Democrats, but just because they need to learn. Republicans have been neglecting their libertarian, what's left of the, the libertarian part of the party for years now, and people are just getting fed up, and so many people have left the party, and they've either joined the Constitution Party or they joined the Libertarian Party, and that's why fewer and fewer and fewer people vote, because they just see the two parties in both the big government, and you have one party, you know, that's the liberal, one party is conservative, so there's not really much difference at all. Sure. Uh, let me say this about the voting, though. As much as I would prefer to see a Democrat in the White House and Republicans then providing some opposition, I would still never, never, never vote for a Democrat. First of all, it would be a dishonest act on my part because I don't want a Democrat in the White House. I don't want what the Democrat wants to inflict on me, which is even more government and health care and all of these other things. Uh, but on top of that, if the Republicans are going to lose votes, I would rather that they lose votes to libertarians than to Democrats, because if they lose the votes to the Democrats, then they're in going to be encouraged to become even more like Democrats, whereas if they lose the votes to the libertarians, and the libertarians get a significant number, and I'm not talking about 10%, but even 1%, or some large number, which would be a large number, uh, large number historically, then they will be encouraged to become more like libertarians to try to get those people back into the party. So you don't gain anything by voting for the lesser of two evils, whether you think that lesser of two evils is a Republican or a Democrat. You are still going to get big government, and nobody's going to learn from it if you vote for a big government candidate, whatever his party is. One thing that I've said before, and I'll just endlessly repeat it, and that is that if you vote for somebody as the lesser of two evils, he does not say if he wins, ah, oh, thank God I was the lesser of two evils. They didn't like me, but they hated my opponent even more, and fortunately, I made it into office. No, he's not going to say that. He's going to say they love me. They want my health care program. They want all the big government programs that I have either promoted in the past or that I promised in my campaign statements. They are giving me their vote. They are giving me their endorsement of all of my big government ideas. So you are playing with fire when you vote with somebody. Vote for somebody as a lesser of two evils. Yep. Jacob, right, thanks you. so much for calling. Glad to hear, hear your views on this, and 
I hope to hear from you again in the near future. And as long as we're on the subject of gay marriage, let me take Rick next, Rick in Tennessee, because I understand that he also has some comments on that subject. Rick, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi. Um, hi there, Rick. What's up? Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm going to come down on the other side of the gay marriage issue, and uh, I, I hear a lot of people uh, say that there's no harm there and that it's not going to see the sky's not falling, things like that. Um, for me, I look at it as a zero-sum game. What's it going to cost me as a taxpayer? And in the end run, it's going to cost me dollars. Um, and my point is that marriage is, a, uh, is not really a right. It's a social institution. And communities historically have come together um, to, to see young people get married because they provide the, the next generation of taxpayers. And before they were taxpayers, they, they were the people that would take care of them when they got older. Um, and that historical structure, you start to undermine it in a society that has already $5 trillion in debt, really can't afford uh, these additional expenses, which would be Social Security. Um, so you're looking at it as a bookkeeper? As a bookkeeper, but also as a fundamental social structure that I don't think that uh, gay marriage attacks uh, heterosexual marriage. I think gay marriage attacks societal structures, the pillars of society uh, directly. You said that it will wind up costing the rest of us, and perhaps you could give us an example of a way in which we will wind up paying for people who are homosexuals and get married. Okay, um, a couple of examples would be one, you, as soon as you make, make it legal, uh, a gay couple gets married, um, one, of the, one of them dies in a horrific car accident, which would be a terrible tragedy. And then immediately the other one would be able to go and collect Social Security benefits for the rest of their life. Um, and you and I would pay for that. Um, but there would be no children coming out of that deal because they wouldn't be able to have any children. And that's really the whole point. Um, but also, you'd have health, health insurance benefits that would be paid out. And I wouldn't make the case that, uh, of higher age rates uh, and, you know, causing extensive medical benefits that way. But I would say there would be costs associated with that. Um, but the main thing is that society makes investments. I just heard an ad about investments. And I think if, here's, if I can make a quick analogy of a farmer who has, you know, two roosters, two hens, and a rooster and a hen, it would be foolish for the farmer to make these kind of investments in the first two unions that they might make in the third union, and you know, for a hen house and for hay and stuff like that. That's a simplistic view, but the farmer's just the government, and the government needs to make the appropriate investments, and, and they have historically. Well, the farmer is making the investment in the rooster and the hen because he wants to make money off of the eggs and the chickens that will be produced by it and so forth. There is no reason for the state to make an investment or even to have an interest even in a greater population. And you can say that there will be greater revenues and so forth, but we, the people, have no particular interest in seeing a greater population. Obviously, politi pardon me, and greater revenue to the state. Obviously, politicians love that, but it's of no benefit to us as individuals. As far as the Social Security example is concerned, which is the, the one example where taxpayers may wind up paying, as a result of uh, gay marriages, do you really think the government should be providing that kind of insurance anyway? Uh, what is your opinion about government providing life insurance to individuals? Well, well that's, a, that's a separate issue altogether. And I, well, I would think actually, it, it isn't, is. because what, what happens, and this is so typical, and I'm not blaming you, I'm blaming the politicians, but this is so typical, the politicians create a bad situation and then use that bad situation as an excuse for other bad situations. We've created this bad situation with health care, for instance, by letting the government into it so far, and now so many people can't afford health insurance and can't afford hospital stays and can't afford doctor visits and so on, that the government's got to provide it. Well, in the same way, they've created this phony, fraudulent social insurance system called Social Security. And uh, now, because they've set this up where they're, they have no constitutional authority uh, to be there in the first place, and they, of course, are running deficits that are just horrendous and creating liabilities that are going to cause real, real problems for people 10, 20, 30 years down the road for your children or grandchildren, then, of course, this provides an excuse that we can't let gays get married because they automatically get certain benefits under Social Security. The answer is to get rid of Social Security. The answer is to get rid of government programs so that we are not divided and we are not afraid of other groups. Almost all the divisions that occur in society between blacks and whites, between young and old, between homosexuals and heterosexuals exist because each side feels it has to control the government so that the other side doesn't get control of it, so the other side doesn't benefit from it, and so on. But if the government weren't involved, we wouldn't be afraid of the others because there's nothing that they can do to harm us if they, by getting control of the government. And I think that these are diversions. And as I, I mentioned before, the politicians use this to play to the crowd. They don't really care about marriage. They don't really care about Social Security. They don't really care about your health care. They don't really care about anything except getting reelected and playing to the constituencies that will send them money and help them get reelected. And we should not be beating up, in effect, not physically, but but mentally beating up on people and depriving them of doing what they want to do simply because the politicians have created such a mess. Well, that's more than you wanted to hear on the subject, Rick. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's great to hear that. I mean, I agree with you. Social Security is a, it is the same thing that the society has decided that it wanted to. And what do you do about... Uh, no, society, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but society never decided that at all. 
Uh, nobody ever voted on it. Franklin Roosevelt got Congress to pass it, and they passed it under fraudulent circumstances in the sense that they promised it that it was going to be one thing, and as usual, three years later, they changed it completely. And, of course, it just grew like Topsy, and every time it got into trouble, they raised the rates. And, of course, every time they raised the rates, they raised the benefits as well. So just a few more years later, it's about to collapse again, so they have to go through another Social Security reform and so on. And no one's ever had a clear shot at it to, to be able to say, look, if we gave up this whole thing, here's what you'd have instead. Here's what you could do with that. My God, uh, Rick, if there were no Social Security and you had that 15% every year for yourself, you could put five of the 15% into a bank savings account and come out further ahead than you are with Social Security, if Social Security even lasts long enough to pay off the promises that it has made to you. Absolutely, but what happens to the person that falls off the ladder because they're stupid or whatever reason and they break their leg, break their neck, and they had three children? What do you do with that person then? Oh, society has always taken care of such people. That, that's, the, that's the big fraud, right, is the idea that only government can take care of those people. Uh, we have had churches. We have had the Salvation Army. We have had charity hospitals. We've had free clinics in the inner cities. All of these things have been available for the people who are less fortunate, whether by their own devices or by just bad luck. Uh, there have always been places to take care of them. People have never starved in the streets of America as they have in so many other countries of the world. People have always been taken care of because there are always other people who want to take care of them. But the difference between that and doing it through government is that everybody who is involved is doing it because he wants to do it. When the government is involved, everybody who's doing it is doing it because somebody's got a gun in his back. Um, I, I agree with you in a lot of ways. And that's a libertarian view on things. I would, I, I would describe it that way. Sure. Um, getting back to the original uh, premise, though, is that um, why should I pay for somebody else? Just like I shouldn't pay for somebody else's Social Security benefit in any event. Maybe, according to you, but why should I? Uh, why should the benefits of marriage be bestowed upon um, people historically that have, have not gotten them? Well, if you believe that marriage is a creation of the state. Uh, which is, and I know you don't because it's such an absurd uh, idea that I, you're too intelligent for that, but politicians act as though marriage is a creation of the state. I love my wife because of my, what my wife is, not because the state has said that I must take a wife or that I'm allowed to take a wife or whatever. My wife and I would be together, whatever. If marriage were outlawed, my wife and I would be together. And maybe legally she wouldn't be called my wife, but we would be together. Uh, marriage should have nothing whatsoever to do with the state. If you're religious, then maybe it is a religious rite, a religious ceremony. By rite, I mean R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T. Uh, but the point is that it may be a religious thing to you, and it may be a civil thing to you, but whatever it is, it should not be a legal thing. It should not be something that the state bestows, because the state has no business whatsoever in my love life. Well, there's, there's some truth to that, but I think marriage is an institution for the protection of the woman and the children more than it is for the rights of the man. Well, then the, then the woman just simply uh, has to say no. If, uh, if she's not getting what she wants, then she should say no. And if you say, well, we don't want her to have to say no, we want to take care of her, we want to re re uh, pardon me, relieve her of the responsibility, uh, then what you're going to have is a lot of irresponsible women. Uh, the only way you get responsibility among people in society is to set them free, to make their own decisions and to be responsible for their own lives and to pay the consequences when they don't do the thing that they need to do to get what they want. But if right. somebody rushes in and takes care of them and protects them every time and says, don't worry about it, we'll shield you, then what you're building is a nation of irresponsible people. And that's absolutely true, and that's the problem with our country today, is that we, is that people are too stupid to make the right choice a lot of the time, and they aren't held accountable for their poor decisions, and, and, society, and government comes in and, and holds the bag for them. And then they have more children who are just like them, and, and it's, uh, it's reverse Darwinism, basically. Right, but the answer is not to try to make people responsible first, because you simply can't do it as long as the government is bailing them out. The answer is to set them free. If you want more responsible people, set them free. And some of the people will fall by the wayside for a while until they learn what they have to do to survive. And those who are not capable of surviving will get the help of people who want to help them. And there will always be people who want to help them. But those, you will wind up with far, far, far fewer people seeming to need help if you have that kind of a system in one, instead of one in which everybody is entitled to whatever they think they need from the government, which is what we have today. But we're not going to get to where you want to go by tinkering around with the government. The, what we have to do is to pull the rug out, not from under society, but to pull the rug out from under government and let government get by on less than $100 billion a year, and then suddenly you're going to find an awful lot of problems in society that seem solvable only by the government are going to be taking care of themselves, and we're not going to have to worry about them anymore. And, and within five or ten years, we will have forgotten about those problems, just as today people have forgotten what it was like before the government got in, what low-cost health care was like, what low-cost college educations were like before government was subsidizing all of this stuff. How and and what, what kind of harmony existed before we had affirmative action and the Americans with Disability Act and all of these other things that we're supposed to bring about harmony and have done just the opposite? Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. I, I just, I, how do you get there, like you said to me, and I think how do you dismantle the structure that you're talking about? I, I don't see it happening anytime soon, although I, was, I think it would be great because I pay over $1,000 a month for my uh, health insurance right now. Wow. That's, that's, that's a rough. amount, right, because I'm an independent trucker. Um, I absorb the whole cost. 
and now the government says they're going to give it to somebody else for free. And for some reason, I know I won't get it for free, even when they give it to someone else for free. You know? <laughs> How did you figure that out? <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, it, I, it's something I assume. that my cost will actually go up because I have to subsidize another person, you know, yeah. just... It's frightening. It's You're frightening. absolutely right. Uh, to answer your question of how we dismantle the state, uh, it's not something I can answer in, in a sentence. And, of course, I never answered anything in a sentence but, uh, or even a paragraph. But I would recommend a book on the subject called The Great Libertarian Offer. And it describes how we get from here to there. And it's written by somebody named – what is the author's – oh, it's Harry Brown. So okay. uh, I look it up on Amazon, uh, The Great Libertarian Offer. It's out of print, but Amazon always has some good uh, used copies that are in good condition. So maybe, uh, maybe you'll enjoy reading it because uh, you and I think a lot alike uh, – we just are coming at it from a little different angles. I appreciate you. your Thank comment. You very much. Thanks so much for calling, Rick, and uh, stay in touch with us. And let's go right back to the phones. Todd in Gaithers, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Todd, you've been waiting a long time on the phone, and I appreciate it. Are you there with us this evening? Hello, Mr. Brown. How are you? I'm just fine. Thanks so much yeah, for waiting. I'm glad I actually got to meet you because uh, I admire a lot of libertarians. So. Well, and I admire a lot of people who admire libertarians. So okay. thank you for calling. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I know that you were born in 1933, wasn't it? That's right. And uh, you're my grandfather's age. He talks about those times, too. And I know that you grew up uh, during the Great Depression, and I'm sure you remember FDR and all these characters, Herbert Hoover. And I mean, you probably don't remember Herbert Hoover, but you remember him being talked about. Oh, sure. Actually, I didn't grow up during the Depression uh, in the sense that the Depression was off of people's minds when the Second World War started, and I was only eight years old when the Second World War started, so I don't have any war stories about the 1930s. I was just too young to be paying attention to anything, and I didn't start voting until I was 10 years old. But uh, I just want to ask, uh, what do you think, knowing that you're a libertarian, what do you think started the Great Depression? And I'm, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate. Sure. Here. I'm sort of playing a little like Tim Russert in some ways. You know, we kind of know what side he's on, but you know, he's playing devil's advocate. Sure. So what, what do you think started the Great Depression? Well, I think... Uh, Partly to understand the Great Depression, you have to understand the recession of 1921. America, during the uh, First World War, underwent uh, horrendous inflation. The Federal Reserve had just been inaugurated in 1913, and the Federal Reserve system... I'm writing this down. I'm sorry? I'm writing this down. Oh, okay. In 1913, the Federal Reserve began to control the money supply in the country. It right. determined how much new money would come into circulation, and they would speed up the initiation of new money, or they would slow it down. And, of course, during the First World War, they speeded it up tremendously, and it created quite an inflation. And it was a typical wartime phenomenon. And after the war was over, it was necessary for all kinds of maladjustments in the economy, all kinds of artificial and temporary things that had happened during the First World War to be flushed out of the system. And so it could be a very difficult and challenging time and a, and a very time for a lot of people. So the inevitable recession occurred in 1921, and it was very deep, but it was very quick. It was over in a little over a year. The whole thing was over. All right, then come the Roaring Twenties. The Federal Reserve starts pumping up the money supply again, and in 1929, the Federal Reserve, as so often happens, realize they have overextended the situation. They've pumped too much money into circulation, and they have to slow it down tremendously. Well, these days, up in the year 2000 and so on, in the 1980s and 1990s, what they do is they slow down the growth in the money supply, meaning that if the money supply has been growing at 7% a year, 10% a year, they might slow it down to 5% a year. Well, back in the 1920s, they didn't just slow down the growth of the money supply. They actually deflated the money supply, meaning they pulled money out of circulation. The way they do that is a technical thing that we could get into some other time, but the important point is that the money supply actually contracted, and it brought on a stock market crash, and then the dominoes started to fall, and various companies started to go under, and all sorts of things happened, and the Federal Reserve System, with no idea of what to do, continued to deflate the money supply, and the price level went down. Actual prices were falling rather than rising, as they have been doing pretty much continually, say, since the Second World War. If, and, I, could just, if I could come in real quickly here. Sure. Herbert Hoover, he put together, I can't remember the exact name of what this tariff was called, the Smoot Hawley uh, tariff, yeah, uh, which that. created a terrific problem. It just magnified the situation by cutting off trade with foreign countries. And that aggravated it, but it did not, it was not the primary cause. The primary cause was bad Federal Reserve policy. And we're about to take a break, so let me make this point before we break, and then we can continue it after the news. But the main thing is that that recession of 1921 should have been terrible. It was over in a year because the government didn't do anything. Because the government tried to solve the problem in 1929, that depression went on for 15 years. And that's the difference. And we were talking about the Great Depression. Let me just sum up again where we were before the break and then get your comments, Todd. And it's just simply this, that when there was a depression in 1921, and it was called the Depression at the time, the government did nothing. 
Warren Harding was the president, and the government did not undertake any great programs, any unemployment insurance or anything else, and the Depression was over in a little over a year. In 1929, another Depression hit. Herbert Hoover instituted what was called the First New Deal. And when Franklin Roosevelt ran for president in 1932, he criticized Hoover as being too activist, that the government was too big, there were too many bureaucrats, he was going to cut taxes, he was going to cut the size of government by 25%, cut the federal payroll by 25%, and of course he did none of those things. But the point was that the government did intervene, tried to make everything all right for people, and the Depression went on for 16 years because it really didn't end until the end of the Second World War. So, Todd, anything further? Uh, sure, if I could just come in here. Um, the facts are what you're saying is that the federal government did nothing in 1921, and we survived that Depression. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and it was over right away because what the government does actually prolongs the Depression rather than ending it, even though they do it in the guise of, of trying to end the Depression or make it easier for people. And, and can I just say uh, one or two more things here? I know how when you were a kid, I'm sure you heard, people used to say, President Hoover, he started the Great Depression. Do you think that he was the one that solely started the Great Depression? No, it was the Federal Reserve System by its poor policy. And we've been suffering for that poor policy for almost 100 years now, since 1913. You know, one of the interesting things about it is that the Federal Reserve was brought to the United States with several promises, typical political promises. One of them was that it was going to end the panics and depressions in this country. Another one was that it was going to make a stable currency and end the periods of inflation and deflation. Well, I'll tell you, in 1913, the price level in the United States was about one-third lower than it had been 100 years before that. Since then... The, the price level now is about 13 times as high as it was in 1913. In other words, in 100 years, they have reduced the value of the dollar to about 7 cents, and that's what they have done to fight inflation. The Federal Reserve has been a disaster in every conceivable way, and the only answer is not to get better people in there, not to reform it, but to get rid of it, return to a gold standard, and keep government's hands off of our money. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, uh, I kind of think that, even though I'm a little bit more of a moderate libertarian, I kind of think that if we had followed Hoover's policies of rugged individualism, although he didn't follow that totally, because uh, I'm reading a book written by him called Challenge to Liberty. I don't know if you've read it. It was written in 1934. Yeah, I'm sorry to say this, but Hoover was not a rugged individualist. That is one of the myths of history, that Hoover stood aside and Roosevelt moved in and solved the Depression. Well, Roosevelt didn't didn't end the Depression, and Hoover was no rugged individualist. Hoover was a big government man. He was a, a big government man in his uh, job as Secretary of Commerce in the earlier administrations, and he was a very big activist. He was jawboning industry to hold prices up, even though the money supply was shrinking and prices naturally were falling, but he tried to keep wages up and prices up, and as a result, uh, when prices are higher than the market would call for, then nothing gets sold. And when wages are higher than the market would call for, nobody gets hired. And he was doing all the wrong things, and he was intervening on behalf of the government. So he did not cause the Depression, but he sure as heck didn't do anything to help us get out of it. If he had just stood aside, the Depression probably would have been over by sometime in 1930. Well, I'm still very young. I'm, I'm being educated on this stuff, so... Well, thanks so much for bringing it up, Todd, and stay with us and check in from time to time with questions or comments. We'll be glad to hear from you. Okay. Thanks Let's go now to Hollywood, California, and talk with Wyatt. And, Wyatt, I really do need to apologize to you. You've had to wait on the phone for quite a while. Um, uh, just to say, it's Hollywood, Florida. So oh, Hollywood, Florida. <laughs> well, same difference. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how's the movie business out there? In, in Florida, Hollywood, Florida, I don't know. There's yeah, no... I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's up tonight? Um, nothing much. Well, the question I was going to ask was marriage even originally a, a state thing? Wasn't it something granted by the church? I would think so, but I really don't know that much about it. But I think you're most likely right that it started out as a religious sacrament and a religious ceremony, and whether it started with the Christian churches or started with the uh, Jewish uh, religion or whether it's, it preceded even uh, that uh, with some of the pagan religions, uh, I really do not know. And uh, I, But I really can't imagine that it is somehow an invention of the state, but even if it were an invention of the state, there is no reason that we should turn to the state to try to decide what constitutes a marriage or what constitutes love. Uh, the next thing we'll be doing is asking the state if it's all right to have children. I, I, agree, I agree with that. Um, I, 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 would, I would think it would be okay if it were like a church thing and the church didn't say, I'm going to call, call you married, but if it's a state thing or a state private or something, I think everyone should have an equal right to it as, as anyone, but it's not a not a good thing that they're like providing benefits to, to these people, which is. Which you mean I'm government benefits? Do you mean government benefits? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you, and uh, I, I would like to remove that from all marriages and all situations but, because it's none of the state's business, and if the state handles it, it's going to be handled badly. And so let's put it in the hands of the people who will do it correctly, which means people who are voluntarily chosen by the people involved, and that's the only way it's ever going to work properly. So. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people on the other side uh, who argue or who argue for, argue for it. Um, uh, one of the main reasons is that they shouldn't be getting benefits 
benefit if since um uh, since you know they're not producing children uh, children but but you know. Well, let me tell you, Wyatt, my wife and I have been married for 18 years, and we don't have any children. We have never produced any children together. Does that mean we are bad married people <laughs> and that we should be outlawed or, what, ostracized or anything else? No, of course not. Um, I was, I was going to say, but if you, if you went, went with all, all, all the things and got rid of those benefits, too, it kind of fits, fits together, together more rather than people wasting money on this. Don't waste that money on, on any of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I agree. That was what I was saying to Rick, is that the problem is not with gays adding to the, the burden of state finances, but rather that the state shouldn't be involved in these things at all, and it shouldn't be a matter of state finances. I agree. Wyatt, thanks so much for your call. Glad to hear from you. Keep in touch. Let's uh, move quickly out to Arizona and talk with Bonnie. Good evening, Bonnie. Hi. Well, so much for the past. Now we can go into the future here. Okay. You know, we've got a big problem out here in Arizona where we had problems with the Mormons. And I don't see how you can keep out keep government out of religion in that sense. I mean, you could have... People, depending on what religion they're in or what cult happens to come up, you could have uh, people having harems, and you know, <laughs> you know, you've got a lot of poly- polygamy going on right here this, this, today in, in the state of Arizona. Well, is polygamy a threat to your marriage and to your life? Well, when they have, when they marry these young girls and they have these big families, and then they can't afford to feed them, yes, because a lot of them are on state programs. Okay, so the solution is to get rid of the welfare programs. Well, then they would just starve. No, you know, they wouldn't. Here, here, no, they wouldn't starve. In the first place, they wouldn't have the harems if they couldn't support them because they wouldn't want to starve. And it wouldn't take more than it wouldn't even take a generation. It would take like one year or two years for people to suddenly realize what the consequences are of overextending themselves oh. when nobody's going to bail them out. And secondly, uh, those people who, through misfortune or any uh, other event, find themselves really in dire circumstances would be taken care of, probably by the Mormon church or by somebody else. You know, we have uh, over 100,000 churches in America, and not one of them receives even $1 of government aid. Oh, and, yes, they do. Uh, Bush's plan is to give the churches Well, that's Bush's plan, but I'm talking about the, the churches that exist. Oh. I'm talking about the fact that every one of those churches was built through voluntary donations. Every one of them is sustained in its upkeep through voluntary donations, and on top of just sustaining the church and having it there for the weekly services, many of them have charities and take care of other people, and all of this is done voluntarily without government uh, donations, which is, of course, a very good reason to reject Bush's plan entirely for two reasons. First of all, it's not needed, and secondly, once those charities, those religious charities, begin getting hooked on government aid, then government will set the rules for it in order for them to keep getting the money that they're hooked on, and what we will have is a government takeover of religious charities, which, of course, would be disastrous. Okay, well, p- even if they could take it a step further, you're wrong. These people, now, I don't know if it's genetic or not, and I don't know if genetic engineering would ever solve this problem, but there seem to be quite a few of them. And if they do get married, a lot of them do have children. They go through artificial insemination, surrogate, you know, uh-huh. in vitro, all that kind of thing. So you're, you're okay, Bonnie. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just to hang on. We'll be back right after this break. Problem. And right now, we're talking to Bonnie in Arizona, who's concerned about it because it can lead to polygamy, as practiced by the Mormons in Arizona and uh, uh-huh. Nevada and Utah, and put more people on the public dole who can't handle having large <laughs> harems, as she put it, of wives. Bonnie, where were we when we had to break for the I'm commercial? At it. I'm looking at this whole situation 50 to 100 years from now where we possibly have more of these bisexuals and homosexuals, and some of them coming out of these marriages. And I'm looking at what kind of society we're going to have, what kind of military defense will we have with an army that may have a large amount of bisexuals and homosexuals in it. Well, wait, wait a second. I'm sorry I haven't followed you there. Okay, How is gay marriage going to increase the number of bisexuals and homosexuals in society? First place, part of it is environment, and the other part of it is genetics. Now, these people are having children. As I said, they're using their sperm and their eggs, and they're having children, which would possibly continue the, the continuation of that gene. And I could see a society 100 years from now where we became... We had a quite a few more gay and bisexual people than we have today. And I'm just wondering, where are we going with this? I know I'm looking way ahead, but where is society going with this? I mean, unless this happens in every country on the planet, what, what, is, what are our military front lines going to be looking like unless we're all, we have nothing but robots? You know? Well, as long as the <laughs> government chooses to bully everybody around the world, then we do have to worry about what our military, uh, how strong our military is going to be, because we're yeah. certainly going to have to use it over and over and over again. Uh, but I'm not totally against gay marriages, because I do feel I'm, I'm for the whole unions, you know, the unions, but I, I feel a little uncomfortable when I start thinking about them adopting and then having children, and they're promoting this lifestyle as the norm. Well, what you're doing is suggesting that we should take legal action today to prevent something that might happen in 50 or 100 years. And do we really want to be rearranging people's lives and imposing fines and imprisonment on people for something that might happen in 50 or 100 years if we don't prevent it? I don't think fines or imprisonment, but we could maybe just stick with the whole union, maybe not make it so easy for them to adopt. 
maybe not make it not so easy for them to go to the. Of course, you know you don't have to go to the doctor to get artificially inseminated, but you make some of those procedures a little harder for them to get. But I, I don't know. You know, I, I have some gay friends, and I think they're very nice people and all that. But then I look at it, and like it or not, to me, it's still abnormal. It's not normal. Well, I can I can look around society, and I see an awful lot of heterosexual marriages, and mm-hmm. you can't help but look at some of those marriages and say, God, I hope those people don't have children. And then you've got the dilemma with bisexuality too. There's more of that emerging. I'm going, what is going on? You know. So, well, anyway, some things I agree with you on, and some things I just haven't sorted out in my mind yet completely. Well, stay with us, and uh, maybe you'll come to agree more, and maybe you'll come to hate me. Who knows? Even with Social Security, I know people that are on disability that if they did not have that, they would be out in the streets because there is a breakdown of the family nowadays, and there is nobody to take care of these people. And No, because the government's run all the caretakers out of business. Well, I don't know what a lot of these people would do unless you want to uh, have assisted suicide and then shoot them or something. Well, we can continue on the path that we're on now until we reach the point where nobody but the government has got any money left to take care of anybody, and we will all stand in line to get taken care of when we're sick. Or what we can do is to call a halt to it and return to a society in which each person is responsible for himself, and if he can't take care of himself, then he will rely on the kindness of strangers, as Blanche Dubois put it, and be taken care of far, far better than he would in a veterans hospital or any other kind of government facility. Actually, I think in the future, and I'm talking many, many years from now, we might find that we need capitalism and socialism both. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Maybe eventually we'll become so automated we'll tax our robots, robots and use that for some part of socialism. Well, you mean we would have know. capitalism and socialism instead of the socialism we have now? We need a little bit of both. You know, Buckminster Fuller said Americans abhor socialism, but they have to ensure their, their bank accounts, therefore they do have socialism. Well, so I, I'm not for complete socialism because I, I'm, I'm not a Democrat and I'm not a Republican. <laughs> No, but <laughs> insuring bank know, accounts is a good insuring Bonnie insuring bank accounts is a good example. Before bank accounts were insured, the richest people in society took care of the poorest by paying attention to what the banks were doing to make sure that they were safe. Once the government stepped in, nobody had to pay attention anymore, and then we had a huge savings and loan crisis. Thanks for calling, Bonnie. We're going to take a break right now. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Right now, we're going to talk to Mark in New Orleans. Mark, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about this farce called the investigation into the problems with intelligence regarding yes. the invasion and a murderous attack on Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, these, uh, these people in the Senate or, or, the, or Congress as a whole, they're, they're playing into George Bush's hands in that uh, this had nothing to do with bad intelligence or lack of intelligence or anything of that sort. Uh, the invasion of Iraq took place because you had a, you know, a malevolent, murderous, fascist creep who just thought that he would, you know, thought that he would use the uh, uh, his position of power of a, of, a, of a great nation of ours, you know, for his own uh, uh, self-aggrandizement and you know, and just this desire to be the emperor of the world for a year or whatever. Yeah, there. Are, uh, we, we don't need to go into it, but there is no question that George Bush was going to go to war with Iraq, no matter what the CIA told him. Well, in fact, I have clippings from the newspapers uh, where he was twisting the hands of, uh, of, of the CIA officials, where he actually was pressuring them to alter, to doctor their reports so that they could uh, come up with the uh, reports that would justify, you know, his, uh, his invasion. Sure. Uh, and, and, and another thing is, is, is the fact that uh, we don't even have to accept, and I don't personally accept the premise, that just because even if they would have found something in Iraq, that there was a reason to uh, attack Iraq. Because, uh, Absolutely. Because Saddam Hussein had given them open, uh, free hands to confiscate whatever they found. Yes. So even if he, even if they would have found a stockpile of nuclear weapons and pathogens and nerve gases or whatnot, uh, the United States was going to take possession of it. So and even let's take it a step, Mark. Let's take it a step further. Let, let's say that he wouldn't have allowed them to take it. What would Israel do? What would Pakistan do? What would China do? What would Russia do? What would England do? What would France do if the United States said we were going to come in and take your weapons? Obviously, none of them would stand for it. And the whole thing is based on the premise that the United States had, States had a right to disarm Saddam Hussein. And there is nothing in international law, there is nothing in international tradition that says that you, your country has a right to go over and attack somebody else simply because they have the same arms that you have. Absolutely. Well, that's the reason why we have to attack that uh, particular premise, but uh, unfortunately, uh, very few people are doing it. I You're think right. The only person that I've heard uh, doing it is you. Uh, uh, I find, in, 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 especially among the Libertarian Party candidates, that's the reason, at this particular point, I'm, I'm not planning to vote for any of them because they, you know, they just lack, uh, you know, they're playing into the Republican hands, and I don't like that. We yeah. cannot go and follow their premises. We have to reject them and expose them. Uh, and uh, last week, uh, you were talking to someone about, uh, or I think maybe two weeks ago, you were talking about, you were comparing George Bush to, uh, to Hitler. And I think you were criticized for that. And I, and I think that's, uh, that is a very appropriate comparison, because uh, uh, I believe uh, George Bush to be just as malevolent and uh, a bloodthirsty killer, is just uh, every bit as uh, is 
as Hitler and Stalin were in, in, in Clinton. Uh, now, it is true that he hasn't killed as many people as these people uh, were alleged to have killed, but that's only because he hasn't had the chance. He's just I, started. I, I have, there's no question in my mind about it. And if he had been the same George Bush, if his soul and mind, if he would have been the leader in, 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 and he would have had Hitler's body in the 30s in Germany, he would have been just as cruel and, uh, and just as murderous as Hitler was. There's no question in my mind about it. Because uh, one who would, uh, you know, who would, who would have uh, no trepidation, no scruples about murdering as many people as he has, uh, civilians and many other people in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and, and he's ready to do it in other countries, uh, you know, if, if he can kill hundreds of thousands, I think he, you know, he would have no scruples about doing it to millions. No, as long as it was for what he considered to be a good cause. It's interesting that he has never apologized to the American people for any of the misleading statements he made about aluminum tubes, about Niger selling enriched uranium to uh, Iraq, and for the al-Qaeda training camps in Iraq, and the unmanned vehicles that could carry weapons of mass destruction and drop them on the east coast of the United States, and all of these other fanciful things. He's never apologized for one of them, and he's never shown the slightest bit of remorse that innocent people have been killed. He has never indicated in any way whatsoever that that is a problem, that innocent people have died in the course of all this, whether it was for a good cause or a bad cause, innocent people have died, and that doesn't seem to affect him at all. And given all of that, it is hard to ever take the attitude that George Bush was misled or abused by the intelligence agencies. Absolutely, and uh, I, I think more than ever we have to really uh, compare him to uh, Hitler because that's a very appropriate uh, comparison. And, and, and it's interesting, and just like you said, when I was calling your program uh, you know, several years ago and I was... Uh, Criticizing and, uh, and expressing my hatred for uh, for Clinton, uh, you know uh, that these conservatives didn't come out of the woodwork and, 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 and you know and suggest anything that you were over the top. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, oh, you're absolutely right, Mark, and I remember that. And they were glad to hear what you had to say then, but it's a little too close to home now. Mark, I'm going to move on sure. because we've got so many people waiting, but I always appreciate hearing from you. Thanks Thank so much, you much for calling. Much. And now, Stephen, in Texas, are you with us this evening? Hi, Harry. Yes. I think that what keeps the gold standard from becoming a reality is the love of big government and war. And that if people, the American people ever fall in love with freedom again, it, it'll be the gold standard that'll become the hot issue in public debate. What is your? Wouldn't that be uh, nice if that's what we were arguing about instead of the war in Iraq? Oh yes. What is your position on the short-term uh, prospects for gold and the long-term prospects for well, gold? Well, in the short term, the prospects are not. Uh, oh, are you talking about gold as an investment? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't believe and, anybody. And can also, as as a uh, becoming the standard for our our money. Okay, as an investment, I have no opinion because I don't believe anybody can predict the future. But as for a return to the gold standard, I don't think that it's in the cards for the near future simply because of the fact that it is much easier to stay on the gold standard once you're on it than to get back on it once you fall off. And it is not impossible for the long term, though, because if we get to the point where we repeal the income tax and we do other things and reduce the size of government and people see how much better off they are as a result, it's going to build a momentum that's going to sweep along with it such things as getting the government out of our money system and getting the government out of a lot of areas that people have always assumed, even people who wanted smaller government have assumed, must be government functions. And uh, how far that will go, no one can say. But all I'm saying is that short term, I don't believe the prospects for a return of the gold standard are very good, but over the long term, it's possible without saying that it's going to happen. Well, those are very wise words, Harry. I do think that the dollar could be redefined in terms of gold and that interest rates would reflect the real supply of, of and money and rather than credit. artificial manipulation by the right. politicians. Very, very artificial. I mean, the dollar is just, in the last year, it's lost, what, 30% up against all other world currencies? Yeah, it's, it hasn't been good for the dollar on, on the world stage, that's for sure. And I just, I don't know, I just, I don't really have too much confidence in it and the way the policies that the Fed is doing and, and just the whole control of our money. I, I don't like the whole idea of it. It's no, if we don't want government in our health care and if we realize that government has made a mess of education, then we ought to realize that anything so vital to the economy as the way the money system works is definitely something we wouldn't want the government handling. Very Steve, much so, Harry. They really make a mess of just about everything they get in. Right. I really Steve, enjoy your show. Oh, thank you, Stephen, and thanks so much for calling. Let's go to West Virginia and talk with Jack. Good evening, Jack. Hey, how you doing, Harry? This is West Virginia. <laughs> West Virginia. I just want to call to uh, kind of clear up a little something. I've been some information out the lady called before this last gentleman stuff mm -hmm. uh, about Mormons and stuff. Yeah. Um, so she talked about how they practice polygamy and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, people may not know or whatever. At one time, the church did do that, but in a manifesto with the president of the church in 1898, it complied with the laws of the land of the United States, and that is no longer practiced within the church. It's my impression that they agreed to do away with polygamy partly as the price of bringing Utah into the Union, but I'm not really sure of that. But I think what the problem is, as far as some people see it, is that there are people either who have broken away from the church or there is a particular element within the church that still wants to practice polygamy uh, and even do so despite the fact that it's against the law in the state of Utah, against the law in the state of Arizona and Nevada and so forth, uh, that there are still people practicing it. But as you're pointing out, this is not church policy. Right, exactly. You know, So it's just like, you know, I wouldn't want... Uh 
people to be misjudged by someone who didn't have the proper information. And I listen to your program a lot of stuff. I'm warming myself, and uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify that, uh, let them know that that's not the teachings of the church, and that if you are practicing it and they know it, you will be excommunicated from the church because, you know, they just don't go that road anymore. And uh, I, I understand. Let me make one comment about this whole thing, and that is that one of the arguments has been among conservatives that I've seen on talk shows and so forth, that, gee, if we legalize gay marriage, where do we stop? The next thing you know, we'll be legalizing polygamy. And the statement is made as though it is self-evident that that would be a horrendous thing if we legalized polygamy. If we had marriages that existed between one man and two women or two men and one woman, oh, my God, I mean, the world would come to an end. And yet, what's the point? Who cares what other people decide to do with their lives as long as they're not interfering with your life? I agree 100%. You know, like I said, I'm responsible for me and not what anybody else does. But, uh, uh, you know, I just uh, like to <laughs> try to understand each other. And, you know, like I said, if you're not doing no harm to me or my family, whatever, what you do is your business, you know, and... Uh, uh, but, well, you know, I don't think the lady, she probably got her information from someone who didn't know. It, it just it was important to me. I know, and you wanted to make sure that people didn't misunderstand the church's yeah. position right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for clearing that up, Jack, and I'm glad to hear from you. And we have, I believe, Tom from Idaho on the line. Tom, are you with us? Hi, Harry. Well, hello there. Hey, regarding the issue of gay marriage, I'm a conservative Christian, and I think that we ought to separate marriage and state. I mean, if anyone is, in- is destroying the institution of marriage, it's got to be my fellow Christians who are getting divorced and remarried at, at kind of the same rate as non-Christians are. And if marriage is really sacred or a sacrament or whatever, well, then the government shouldn't have anything to do with it. I, I say we should let chair, uh, churches perform marriages according to their own rules. And then if it comes to an issue of inheritance or insurance benefits or tax credits or whatever, just let us write down whatever name we want on the relevant contract. I, I guess I just don't understand what role the government needs to play in marriage except to enforce the contracts that we make. Well, I couldn't have put it better. I think you've summed it up very, 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 very well. Whether I marry my wife or a toaster or a guitar or whatever. <laughs> oh, now, wait a second. That's going too far. We've we got to do something to stop these toaster marriages. Well, I'm just trying to increase the amount of tax credits out there. Yes. Okay, well, I appreciate that, Tom. Thank you so much for adding your voice to this. Thank you. And stay tuned. It really is hard, I know, for some people to not worry about what other people are doing. Most all of the problems that we have where we are afraid of other groups in society whether it's being afraid of homosexuals or being afraid of Christians, being afraid of blacks or being afraid of whites, whatever it is, it's usually something that's been caused by the government, that the government has created some program, some policy, some regulation or something, whereby it enables one group to get its way at the expense of another group. And so that other group fights back, and the first group is scared to death that the other group is going to succeed, because if the other group gets its way, it's going to impose that on the first group, and the first group is going to be the one at the expense of. And if the government weren't involved, there would be bound to be much more racial harmony in this country. There would be much less fear of other groups. There would be much less antagonism. There would be much less worrying about intergenerational warfare of elderly people getting benefits that young people are going to have to pay for through the rest of their lives. We would have none of the petty squabbling that we have now. And another point that I want to make that was made earlier in the evening, and I want to reemphasize it, is that the politicians who claim to be so much worried about the future of marriage and so much in defense of marriage, as they keep putting it, and so much concerned about the moral state of society, these people pander to the lowest elements of society. These people have no moral qualifications whatsoever to make any kind of decisions for other people in society. And more than anything else, they demonstrate by their actions that they don't really care about any of these issues. They are just symbolic issues to use to play to a crowd, to a particular crowd that they're depending upon to get support for their re-election. Uh, as one of our callers very presciently pointed out, Newt Gingrich is the last person in the world to be talking about the defense of marriage when, in fact, he violated all of his sacraments and, and demonstrated that he had very little respect for marriage himself. And, of course, even Bill Clinton talked about the sanctity of marriage. Even Bill Clinton felt constrained by the pressures of the fundamentalist groups to try to make the point that he believed in, in marriage and that he wanted to respect gay people and so forth, but that he did not want to see marriage defiled, and so on and so forth. And, of course, I mean, it is all just sense and nonsense. It's all just talk. But we're going to talk some sense and we're going to talk some rationality next week. So tune in again. Thanks for listening. This is Harry Brown.